Well, hello everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 71. Today's guest is Sarah P. Strom. We'll be with them in just a moment. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been a continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just, just do this because we love poetry. And if you love poetry like we do, please click the like button and share and subscribe and all that good stuff to make sure that poetry spreads around the internet, which is what we want it to do. Now, um, the warm-up poem for today that I thought we would do, um, unfortunately, I have to report, um, a lot of people know, um, and I hate being the first one to tell you, but if nobody knows, Marvin Bell passed away yesterday. And Marvin Bell was one of my favorite poets, a great teacher, a great person. We interviewed him in Rattle number uh, 29, and it's just a marvelous interview. Um, and we did a, we did a uh, tribute to Kim and Anitsu, where we had all of her students um, um, share poems for the tribute section. And the idea for that actually came from thinking about doing that for Marvin Bell at some point, but we'd already interviewed him, so we didn't do it. But um, Marvin Bell just has so many students that he's taught poetry over the years, and um, it's a wonderful conversation, Rattle 29. So I hope you go back and look at that. You can just go to uh, rattle.com and find issue 29 and click on the Marvin Bell interview at the bottom there and read most of it. I think half of it's online, but I'm going to put the whole thing up um, probably tomorrow, I think. Um, but I thought I would share a poem by Marvin. Um, this is from that issue, run number 29. We've published about five of his poems over the years, maybe. And uh, here this one goes. This is uh, Basho's Frog. Basho's Frog by Marvin Bell. The plop of Basho's famous frog when it leapt into the pond, thus seeming to pierce the ancient water, which circled and instantly resealed itself, offers us the chance to crack the silence that overtook the empires and their far-flung armies by hearing again that which the armies could not kill. So too those who traveled to New Zealand to see the full eclipse firsthand were able afterward to feel again the shiver that overtook the land when the night arrived ahead of time, and to remember the cries of the roosters when it was over. Basho's frog at, at the plop. It's the provable moment to be registered among the plopping and croaking and wind shaking the cherry blossoms out of the trees while we were still on the road going to see them. And that's Basho's Frog by Marvin Bell. I thought I would read um, his note. This is actually from the interview. But it's just a great insight into poetry, too, and, and what it meant to Marvin. So here he goes. This is the um, contributor note to uh, Marvin Bell's poem. This is his voice. It's true that no matter what, the literary world is full of insult. When you put yourself out to the public, you're going to get some negative stuff. But writing just feels wonderful. I mean, I love the discovery aspect of writing. I love that. I love saying that I didn't know I knew not knowing where I'm headed, abandoning myself to the materials to figure out where I'm going. Of course your personality is going to come out of it. Of course your obsessions are going to make themselves known. Of course you have a philosophic mind. A matrix of philosophy will be behind things. Everyone has a stance, an attitude, a vision, a viewpoint. All that will come out. But in the meantime, you're just dog paddling like mad. And it, that's fun. That's what I always liked about every art. And that's Marvin Bell. Uh, from his interview in Rattle number 29. So uh, go, do go check that out. It's a wonderful interview. Uh, the whole thing is in the issue, of course. Now, um, today's poet, as I mentioned, is Sarah P. Strong. And um, Sarah has appeared in seven issues of Rattle, most recently this winter's. Um, she started out in 2008 with a poem, and uh, we just love their work ever since. Um, Sarah's the author of two poetry collections, Tour of the Breath Gallery, winner of the Walt McDonald First Book Prize, and The Mouth of Earth, which just came out from the University of Nevada Press. Uh, she also has, or he, They also have two novels, The Fainting Room and Burning the Sea. Their poems appeared in many journals, including The Nation, Southern Review, Poetry Daily, The Sun, all sorts of great things. They are a recipient of a Connecticut Artist Fellowship Award, a Promise Award from the Sustainable Arts Foundation, the Elizabeth Matchett Stover Award, and their work has twice been nominated for a Pushcart Prize. Sarah teaches creative writing at Central Connecticut University and the University of Hartford. And here they are, uh, Sarah P. Strong. Hey, Sarah, how are you doing? Hey, I'm well. Thanks, Tim. It's so good to be here and to finally meet you face-to-face -face after having a long poetry correspondence uh, 
without knowing what you look like or, or getting to hear your yeah, voice. Yeah, it's just uh, this is what I love about the Rattlecast is just seeing people who I've known for so long through their poems um, and and getting to meet them and, and talk in person. It's just wonderful. Do you want to start us out with a poem? Mm. Sure. Um, I'm, I didn't know that Marvin Bell had died, and I'm uh, kind of taking that in. Um, what a loss and what an amazing poem you just read. Um, yeah, and I, I loved what he said about um, something about that part of the joy of writing a poem for him is the act of discovering what he knows, and and I, I feel that way too. So um, I'm humbled and honored to uh, to share this program with him. Okay, um, this first poem I'm going to read is "Moving a Baby Grand" from my from my first book. And this is a poem, actually, that I had no idea where it was going to go until it started to go there. So this is, this is a good one to follow Marvin's thoughts. Moving a baby grand. The piano is hauled in, a captured elephant, legless, enormously dismaying on its side, blanketed against making a sound, yet too dignified to show humiliation. Up the stairs, such massive weight doesn't seem possible, and yet, there they go, three men sweating with the effort of making a living. At last, in our apartment, they screw the legs back on, and I remember, this old piano's white keys are made of sawed-off tusks. Sometimes the metaphor for suffering turns out to be the suffering itself at which point I stop watching the work and go into the kitchen for three glasses of ice water, which I give to the movers, because if you want the world to be less burdened with cruelty and indifference, this moment you are standing in would be the ideal fulcrum from which to lift a finger, even if it is only to play a single note, say the F above middle C, Though the piano deserves Beethoven, the moving men, champagne, the elephant, the oh, world. It's a wonderful poem. Thanks so much for sharing that. And I have a new appreciation for moving. I tried to move uh, with two friends of mine, a baby grand piano, just up three steps. He wanted to move it from like the landing to like the main living room. Oh my gosh, that was hard. <laughs> like we had I'd crane ideas. We thought we could just be strong enough. And oh wow, it, it took a lot of work. Um, but anyway, um, just a wonderful poem to start out with. And, and since you already talked a little bit about um, the way that, that you go for sort of surprise, I can't remember how you put it, um, when you're writing a poem. Um, and that's what I love about your poems is that when I read them, I have no, like you make these leaps that, that feel like I have no idea where the the imagination came from they're totally surprising but then they feel so complete at the same time how do you how do you do that like what is your writing process like um my writing process is that i s start writing longhand um i usually just start out writing whatever comes into my head um the the theorist peter elbow was a big influence on how i approach writing um and his idea was that you should sort of write as much as you can, as fast as you can, and without judgment as a way of overtaking your conscious mind and your conscious editor because the unconscious um, and your subconscious are more sophisticated instruments to measure and communicate and, and refine um, whatever is going on in, in, inside of you. And, and for me, that works really well. So if the poems are surprising, it was a surprise for me too. I Occasionally I do sit down and think, oh, I want to write a poem and say this. And it's always mm -hmm. a terrible poem and it never gets, it never gets off the desk. Did, did you have a, um, a first poem that surprised you, you know, for the first time, like that, that you didn't know. And then you said, oh, wow. Cause that happened to me. I had a poem um, as a freshman in college and I was just taking poetry as an elective and I wrote it like, oh, wow, I had no idea I knew that. And that's when I fell in love with poetry. Did you have a moment like that? Or or was it sort of a, a more continual process? Gosh, that is a good question. Um, I do remember the first poem I ever had published, um, which was a poem called Pool in the Seattle Review many years ago now, that when I got to 
bit, I had a little ooh moment of realizing um, that I had made something. And there was a sense, um, gosh, I don't know what to compare it to. If, um, if you'd made a mug and then you stuck the handle on it and you had a, you realized, okay, now it's a mug. There was sort of that sense. Like, um, I think there was an aesthetic awareness as well as just, okay, I put some emotions on paper. Yeah, I love that that metaphor um, of of making a mug. And, and isn't the the literal translation from the Greek of poetry like to make or something like that? Or am I misremembering that? You have to get A.E. Stallings back on the <laughs> yeah. show. Ask yeah, her. but but I mean that really is what poetry is. It's making something new, like a new like emotional state or something, or a new a new place in the world, or a new piece of imagination or something. And it's it's actually creation, which is the fun part, at least for me too. Yeah. The writer Stanley Elkin has this great quote where um, he's sort of shutting down somebody who's going on and on in this highfalutin way about what the purpose of art is. And he says, that ain't what art does. And then he quotes this uh, line from a Stephen Sondheim song where he says, a hat, hat, I made a hat where there never was a hat. And he says, that's what art does. You make a hat where there never was a hat. And I always appreciated this sort of um, earthy delight in that yeah yeah i just love that well let's uh let's hear more a few more hats how about that okay all right here's another okay. hat basement this is where it all arrives stacked like baggage at its final destination with the weight of the claimed those so expensive boots that never fit right the set of socket wrenches that were free with a checking account. Everything down here is yours. The mildewed boxes labeled Christmas cards, the wedding dress saved in a body bag, that can of paint you descended these badly lit stairs to retrieve is hidden behind that tent there, its stakes and poles long gone, duffled beneath the battered kitchen table at which you and your father watched Nixon resign. And there beside the furnace is your broken zippered luggage, which someday you might even drag to the curb, abandoning it, though it bears what used to be your address, on tags attached to handles whose leather is worn out from being carried. Excellent. And that was... Uh... Basement from Sarah P. Strong's first book. Do you want to do another one? Yeah. Um, how about if we switch to the new book, The Mouth of yeah, Earth? Perfect. Okay, so this is The Mouth of Earth, which came out just a couple of months ago from University of Nevada. And the the overarching concern of this book is how humans respond to the climate emergency. Um which is something that I was sort of, you know, on the periphery of my radar until about 2013, maybe, um, as it was for many of us. Um, and as I started to learn more and kind of come out of my shell of denial, um, it really had a very, very profound effect on my life in a lot of different ways. And the backbone of the book is really um, grappling with what it means to be on a planet in such a state of emergency um, and an emergency of our own making. So that said, um, the poems in here, I think, are not all dire, um, but so some of them are. <laughs> uh, and the one I'm going to read is maybe so so somewhere in, in the middle of, um, of direness and joyful. And it's called Mobile. <clears throat> It seems it's not enough for us to love the earth the way we loved as infants a milky nipple. What the teacher meant when he told his students, carry water in a sieve. No one could until at cliff's edge he showed them, flung the metal basket off into the Pacific. But we don't sink into the world like that. 
We rise up from the earth's breast and crane our necks over the grasses, distracted by a glimpse of shiny things. You can see it in the baby by eight months. She'll be nursing along in the garden of contentment until some glint of motion snags her eye and the world not even named yet. That blur of green is not yet flock of wild parakeets in northern coastal city. That pink flash not yet classified as musical mobile of plastic ponies, a gift from a baby shower I could not bring myself to keep. The music box rendered the Blue Danube waltz as a series of electronic beep while the ponies rotated, trailing a squishy plastic smell that reminded me variously of asthma attacks, factory workers in China, and Barbie dolls. I saw the real Blue Danube once, muddy with rain in Vienna, a river whose headwaters start before the Roman Empire and run through two world wars bearing fascism and Freudian psychology and schnitzel all downriver to pour into the Black Sea of our seemingly endless need to keep playing with matches, to see what will catch light. I've heard the real Blue Danube, too, once from a man sitting alone on the edge of the stage that was the 20th century, plucking the notes of the waltz on a classical guitar with such exquisite tension between the sweeping music of the river and the tiny syncopated pattern of dancing feet that at least one person in the sparse and hurried lunch hour audience put down their cell phone and wept. Magpies like shiny objects, too, as do starlings, blue jays, crows. Perhaps the commonality persists in us, like our desire for flight, the way a line of music can persist until someone fashions the memory of a time those notes flooded the banks of our feelings with a mechanical ghost of itself that plays us at our plastic worst when what we wanted was the green breath of those first fields blown toward us by the moving shapes of horses. So much of that was Mobile from Sarah P. Strong's newest book, The Mouth of Earth. And that's just a great example, the, the green breath of those first fields. Like, what a line. Um, and in oh. the book, and just all your, your poetry is full of those kind of lines. Um, I want to get back to the book. Uh, but first, I'm curious, we, we sort of um, usually try to start with like, figuring out your journey into poetry. And I didn't know this, but mm. until, or I didn't remember it, uh, but in your first poem, I was going to post it. And you mentioned um, being, um, I think you said the only pregnant plumber in Connecticut at the time. <laughs> 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 um, and that, that is a very unusual, um, you know, place for a poet to be coming from. Um, can you talk a little yeah, about, seriously. about what poem, what poem was that? It was, uh, it was your note from, um, unless I made a mistake. <laughs> no, that was definitely my note. Okay. Yeah. It Do was from the very poem first poem of yours we published. That was the contributing note you sent. You, you know, you explain some things and then you happen to have that phrase. And, mm. um, I just find, um, you know, careers so fascinating and, and, and it's interesting cause I, I would say that that was the first plumber poet we've met. But uh, we actually have uh, The Plumber's Guide to Light coming up as our spring chapbook, uh, which is going to be wonderful by Jesse uh, Bertrand. Um, oh, wow. But, but, um, but I think you're the only two I'm familiar with who've, who've worked mm. in that field. Um, how did you come to poetry? Um, you know, uh, what was that journey like for you? Um, I was a writer way, way before I was a plumber. Um, I think every job that I've had in my life since I was about 16 was chosen um, for its ability to allow me to continue to write. So I actually, um, I wrote poetry in you know, middle school and, and high school, as many of us did. Um, and then I kind of dropped it for a long time because I was writing a novel and then writing another novel. But um, I was at a used bookstore one day and I picked up uh, a I think a high school textbook by X.J. Kennedy called something like an introduction to poetry and started reading it and something about having just a little wisp of, of more formal education in poetry got me really excited to try to write it again. Um, 
And so in my maybe early to mid 20s, I started writing it again fairly seriously. Um, and, and did you find, I mean, have you worked um, a lot of different jobs or? Um... Huh, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find, I always felt like that the best time, sort of the highlight of my like poetry life really was just when I worked sort of manual type jobs which gave mm. you a lot of time to think, you know, because you're working with your hands. Like I worked in a factory, I worked in landscaping um, and um, in a warehouse and all those things. I just felt like I wrote a poem every day because you're just you're daydreaming while you're working. And it's, it's such, such a nice thing for a poet to do. Did you find that? And, and when, now that you teach, do you find it harder to get back into that? If, if that worked for you, do you find it harder to get back to that place? Yeah, um, they're they're very different jobs. And as you say, wow. A great thing about having a manual labor job um, that produces something, especially something like plumbing, where, you know, if if your toilet is clogged and I come to fix it, um, you really, really needed me to be there in a way that people often do not experience um, the immediate need to have another poem written. Right. And and as you say, you know, the part of your mind that is working with words um, is not is not being taxed on the job, uh, other than perhaps deciphering incomprehensible <laughs> instructions. So, um, so yeah, in a sense, you do have a lot of space and spaciousness in here. On the downside, um, you aren't being stimulated in that way. Nobody is sharing interesting poetry and talking with you about it at work usually. Um, and physical labor is exhausting and being physically exhausted, um, it's hard to drag yourself over to the desk and try to come up with something. Um, you know, that said, teaching poetry to undergraduates, um, is much more intellectually stimulating, um, but it's also intellectually exhausting. And, you know, after a day of teaching, especially teaching on zoom, the last thing I Mm -hmm. want to do is look at my own work. Right. So, you know, I don't know that there's um, there's a perfect job. Maybe it would be to teach just one class and, I don't know, <laughs> install one faucet <laughs> and, and spend the rest of the time writing. Um, but I haven't quite threaded that needle. And uh, I quit being a plumber uh, right about the time I graduated from graduate school, which was in 2015. Mm-hmm. So I've been a teacher since then. Um, as far as teaching goes, like, what is the the best advice that you offer your students? You think, like, what, like, if someone comes to you with a poem, um, what is the thing that you sort of are saying that's most helpful? You think, just for all the poets out there trying to write themselves. Um, read a lot. Stay away from negative people, including yourself, <laughs> at times. And be patient. It takes a long time to get good at something, which is not to say that beginners don't produce wonderful, wonderful work. Um, Certainly, I mean, you know this from the Rattle Young Poets anthology. Um, People with no formal training um, sometimes produce extraordinarily meaningful and beautiful work. Um, I think out of the freshness of their gaze. And that's something that we can regain at any age if we, um, if we can sort of figure out how to drop all of the MFA program and the three classes I just taught and, and the, the bookshelf full of books. Um, you know, those things, those things are vital and important and helpful. And they can also sometimes be hindrances. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let me say, um, if anybody has any questions for Sarah, just leave them in the chat window and I will pass them along either on YouTube or Facebook. We have nice sized crowds on both of them. So um, feel free to leave your questions for Sarah and I will pass them along. Um, do you want to read another poem? Sure. How about, oh, okay, let's read, let's read this poem. Um, there are a few prose poems in the book. This is one of them, Diner. Um, I'll say that it's, PG-13, so uh, if there's any kids in the audience, um, your parents might want you to cover your Well, ears. the Rattlecast is rated R anyway, so we're good to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, this, is not be- this is not above okay. an R rating. <laughs> All right. Diner. 
Our special today is pancakes served with maple-flavored corn syrup and decorated with maraschino cherries and pineapple rings, which we can arrange into the shape of a smiley face if you would like that. I'll have the eggs. Today we also have the blueberry blintzes, which come rolled up on a plate like little dolls in blankets, the way you wish your mother used to make them but never did because she was always too hungover on Saturday mornings to get out of bed and your dad had moved to another state. Just the eggs, please. Or perhaps you'd like the dieter's special, fruit cocktail and a scoop of low-fat cottage cheese whose scientific relationship to weight loss is non-existent, but eating it might make you feel virtuous and in control. Bring me the eggs already. Yes, yes, battery cages, beak sawn off, and a cup of coffee. I know, endangered species, habitats wrecked by my daily addiction to caffeine, or never mind the coffee, I'll have a glass of water. Our water has been treated for your dining safety with fluoride and chlorine to protect you from dysentery. Would you like ice and a straw? I feel a bit sick, actually. I'll have some dry toast. Well, perhaps you would like my Purell hand laid on your clammy forehead. What I would like is the very tip of your tongue held against my closed lips until our bodies become the same temperature. I could also crawl across this table and let you peel me out of this cheap polyester uniform without any reference to the ensuing tableau's visual likeness to last month's photo spread in Hustler. Could I get that with a paper napkin blindfold and a side of skin sticking to melamine? Yes, but it's extra. In that case, I'll just have the toast, but with a pat of butter soaking through its gold aluminum wrapper, like the sun going down over a major metropolitan city in America. I'll bring you the check, folded into a white origami crane. Excellent. And that was The Diner by Sarah P. Strong, or just Diner, from uh, Mouth, Mouth of Earth. <laughs> Um, there are two questions come kind to of mind um, after reading that poem. First of all, um, I noticed uh, with all your readings, you have a great way of performing the poems instead of just reading them. And um, do you, um, how do you go about that? Do you, is that something you consciously do or is that sort of just your personality or do you have a theater background? Because it's really a wonderful way to perform, perform poems as opposed to the sing-songy um, you know, way that, that a lot of poets do. Well, all three. Yeah. Um, I do have a background in theater. Um, I used to be a cast member of Improv Boston in Boston. Um, and I also have a background in, in American Sign Language. Um, and so the idea that um, language and grammar is something that is visually communicated on your hands and in your facial expressions. And particularly if you are signing a conversation between two people, it's a convention of American Sign Language to sort of mm. place the speakers, um, particularly if you're interpreting theater. And so drawing on that, especially for a poem like Diner, where there are two speakers, to make it really clear who's talking um, is useful. And I think it's especially useful over Zoom. Um, I do kind of perform anyway, because I, <laughs> I used to be a, a performer performer. Um, but especially now that everything is is online through the screen, I feel like it's so easy to kind of get this like just removal of 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 affect and experience. Um, and I think so. I do it a little more since um, the book came out because all of my readings have been um, have been over a computer platform. And so I'm just trying to kind of um, be more in the room with everybody. Yeah, well, it's just wonderful. And people in the audience uh, have been mentioning it before I even I brought it up myself. So um, mm -hmm. I'm really glad, I'm glad we got you on the screen too for the for the poem as well. Um, the other thing I was wondering about, um, you have, um, it seems like, I'm reminded of um, just a few episodes ago, Brian Sonia Wallace, who does the um, typewriter poems. He goes around and writes poems for people. Um, and he said that the, the three things a poem need, I'm not sure if I'm going to remember right, but for people to like the poem after he gives it to them, they need a bit of humor and then they need something they can relate to. And then they need some kind of, I can't remember what the third one was, but he, he emphasized that the humor was so important because it teaches you not mm. to um, take the poem. It allows you to not take the poem too seriously is what he said. And mm -hmm. I noticed that you do that on a lot of your poems where there's very serious content. You put a little bit of humor in there just to uh, maybe lighten it up or get it to, connect a little bit I don't know is that a conscious thing that you do or is that just another thing that spontaneously appears I don't think it is conscious um 
I think it's maybe, it's funny. I feel like I'm a pessimist by nature, but that's not necessarily apparent in at all in my work as a whole. Um, and I don't know, maybe the, um, what I was saying before about the unconscious or the super conscious be, being wiser than, than the conscious mind, um, maybe writing poetry is a way to sort of get more in touch with the hopefulness and the playfulness that, um, I'm, I'm loath to admit to. Um, yeah. And, and also, you know, writing about such heavy topics as they are in this book, um, why, I don't know how to put this, but like, what, what justifies writing poems, I guess, in a world with, with this sort of, you know, hurtling toward doom? Um, mm. Um, what is it that compels you and, and keeps you getting up writing poems, um, you know, given this uh, situation that, that we're in? Sure. Well, I think I think poetry doesn't actually need to be justified. I think if somebody wants to write a poem, um, you know, making the hat, as it were, um, is enough in and of itself. Um, I think the worst the world is pretty much never a worse place for having more poetry in it. Um, even bad poetry, if people are in touch with the with the creative impulse to make something, that's you know a, an enormous gift that we have as humans that I should absolutely be cultivated at at at, at every opportunity. Um, but in terms of you know writing a book about climate disaster. Um, I really did feel compelled to grapple with it. And one of the things that um, makes me continue to read poetry as well as to write it is to, to stay in, t in contact with what's really happening. It's so easy to be in denial about everything from, um, you know, our own carbon footprint to the way that we really feel about our loved ones to you know, I just ordered this coffee in a styrofoam cup, whatever it might be, um, you know, both on a grand scale and on a small scale, um, the, the ripple effect that our every action makes can be overwhelming. Um, and I, I think I tend to be more of um, a miniaturist in poetry, like to, to, to look at, to look at small things closely rather than to write epic sweeping type poems um for the most part and so part of it is kind of arises i think also out of having had a long-standing buddhist practice um feeling that the need to pay close attention uh is sometimes this is going to sound pretentious but i really mean it is a moral act sometimes um to really commit to seeing things as they are and to recognize what's going on so that you can respond appropriately and not respond in a way that heaps on more suffering. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, how, how did this book uh, come to be? Like, did you find yourself just happen to be writing this these poems or did you uh, set out to do it? And the other thing, um, there's a wonderful, set. I don't think we're going to read any uh, poems from the Dust Bowl section in the middle, um, but there's just a wonderful section of poems about the Dust Bowl. And, um, and, and how much research did you do for those? Is it, is it something that you sort of said, I want to write a book about, e you know, the ecological future and I'm going to do this research mm -hmm. or were you just sort of compelled and, and found yourself doing it? And then, Oh, I have a book. Like what, how did it work? Uh, it was a little bit of both. So, um, most of the poems in this book, I, I wrote while I was in graduate school at Warren Wilson. Um, and I realized, you know, after I had a couple semesters worth of poems, wow, a lot of these are about, um, about the climate emergency. And so then there was this sort of like, okay, this is starting to feel like it might be a book. There's something thematically hanging together here. Um, and thinking about current ecological crises like um, all of the wildfires in the West, for example, um, certainly, you know, climate disaster plays a role in the severity and frequency of those fires. I started thinking about other human-made ecological catastrophes, and the Dust Bowl is one of the largest uh, on record. Um, 
And the fact that we came back for it through massive government intervention, I think, is also instructive here. Um, So I started thinking, huh, the Dust Bowl, and didn't know all that much about it and did a lot of research and learned um, a lot of things, particularly uh, about the experiences of people other than white people. Um, And, you know, mostly when we see, you know, the famous photographs um, of, of migrants leaving because, you know, their farms are destroyed in Oklahoma or wherever, um, we see a lot of poor white people and, there are um, some poems in, in the middle sequence um, that uh, speak to the experiences of black people, of um, native people as the Dust Bowl disaster affects them, as well um, as a lot of the more sort of traditional voices that, that we tend to think of when we think of Dust Bowl history. Yeah, um, I know you didn't in, intend to read one of those poems, but it kind of—I think it would be nice if we could hear one. Would you mind? I yeah, think, sure. You know, they are a yeah. sequence, so everybody can keep that in mind. Um, but but sure. I think one of them—we've uh, already set it up, so I think one of them would work. Okay. All right. Talked um, into it. Good. <laughs> so, so um, it starts out with talking about the prairies before humans existed on the planet at all, um, and and them uh, overrun with buffalo. Um, And then little by little human voices start trickling in. Farmers, um, veterans who come home from World War I and establish a farm. Um, But when the dust storms were at their worst, um, um, I actually wanna look in the notes in the back here to see how many thousands of pounds of dirt it was. fell as far away as the stockyards in Chicago, 12 million pounds of dirt dumped on Chicago, um, uh, in May, 1934. Um, and the one I think I'll read is a fisherman, um, so that they all have names, Margaret Sosi, Shepard, Art McAdams, fisherman, uh, Lula Bowen, housewife and Sunday school teacher, and so on. Um, so the one I'm going to read is Art McAdams, um, the persona of A fisherman on George's bank, which is off the Atlantic coast, you know, he's a couple hundred miles out to sea, nowhere near Oklahoma or Kansas. Um, And this is what happens. Art McAdams, fisherman. Sailing home from George's bank, a cloud in a new shape, blowing not rain, but dirt. Upside down, sky full of dirt, land raining on the open sea, the whole boat, our catch. No one spoke but prayers. When we docked on Friday, my wife said, it was the great plains fell on us. I said, you're nuts. We were a hundred miles out to sea. But the pictures of their farms covered in sand dunes 10 feet high, like our cove after a hurricane. They tore up too much earth, that's all. I'm glad I fish. I take my cod, the ocean closes right back up. Excellent. That was one of the poems from the middle section of, of The Mouth of Earth by Sarah P. Strong. Um, yeah, I think the irony, the irony there being, of course, that um, Atlantic cod are so vastly overfished that um, they're they're in grave danger and um so yeah in in the fisherman's mind in 1934 um there's an endless supply of cod but of course we know now it's not Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah of course um let's see if there's any questions to pass along um let's see just people loving your poems i'm not seeing any questions so if anybody has any questions please pass them along for sarah p strong um um, what has your uh, journey been like through, you know, we're reading poems sort of in chronological order, um, you know, mm-hmm. from your, your life as a poet. Um, how have your poems evolved over, over the course of these two books? Um, is, there, is there a change or, or do you think um, yeah. you're sort of hitting your stride? Um, I never feel like I've hit my stride. <laughs> <laughs> I would say they've gotten more experimental. Um, Part of that is maybe feeling um, like I have more of an ability to try weirder things. Um, And I've read more experimental poets than I had initially. Um, 
I, there are, I, I think the experimental ones are kind of hard to read, but I'll, I'll sort of show you. I'll just hold up a couple and you can see them on the page. Um, so something like this, a word from our raindrop, it can be read across or it can be read down. And either way, it makes sense. But it's two slightly different poems, depending on how you come at it. Um, something like that, I don't think I would have attempted 10, ten years ago. Yeah, I was going to ask about, there are a few poems like that. How did you go about writing those? Those seem really hard to do. Um, is it a thousand drafts? Or uh, I, I can't even imagine. <laughs> no, I, I think um, this is another one, study guide. Um, where you sort of have to draw a line from, you know, connect A to B, like find the right answer as if it were you were practicing for a test. And part of that was like climate disaster. Like, how do I even write a poem about this? It's so overwhelming and I have such difficult feelings about it. And, um, and you know, just emoting on the page does not necessarily result in a good poem that other people want to read, no matter how much you care and are, are feeling feelings about it. And I think part of the experimentalness was also kind of a need to make a container for something that, you know, our minds can't even really comprehend. Um, likewise, all the Dust Bowl poems, actually, most of them are sonnets, which was likewise kind of a way to... Um, be forced to really think about what needs to be in this poem and what is extra and, and needs to be paired away. Um, well, do you want to read another poem from the book? I think Apollo is the next yeah. one. Okay. Yeah. So I'll say in reading um, this book that the way that I conceived of it is that the first section sort of introduces a lot of themes and I don't know ways of coming at thinking about climate disaster and then the middle section is the dust bowl poems and then this third section um kind of brings back the concerns of the first section but I don't know with with more cowbell or <laughs> with with more of a sense of urgency so the Apollos is from the first section okay uh and I'll say um get my reader's copy here. Uh, the Apollos um, are not uh, only a reference to the Greek god, but to the astronauts in the Apollo space program. Um, over the course of the space program, the Apollo mission sent 12 astronauts to the moon overall. The Apollos. If all 12 went back again to stand where they could see this small sphere we call home, rising blue and gray and distantly warm, small as a raindrop tongued from a lover's face. And with that long view of the cloudy, indistinct and lovely shapes suffering assumes when seen from a distance, how would these tiny props, vanished rivers, cracked reactors, bullets, Cops, cathedrals and piles of gray stones, our rising wisps of smoke, our lead leached bones, appear. Looking down like that, could one man feel a shift inside his chest? Could he, blessed with no particular divinity, become, by virtue of this gaze alone, some sort of god, albeit a human one? who doesn't really know the fullness of his powers or their limits, save that he can't be everywhere at once and that he can only see at most the lit side of a face and that if we don't weight him down, he floats. That was the Apollos from The Mouth of Earth. I think since it's such a thematic book, I think maybe um, you should just read the last two poems that you wanted to share from the book. Yeah, um, let me read After This Earth next, which is um, a direct callback to the Apollo's poem in the first section. This is one of the later poems in the book. After this, Earth could become a worry stone in the pocket of space or a mood ring on the finger 
of a newly minted god. Perhaps a sucker for a throat sore from saying again and again the same thing. Or a locket at the neck of an aurora. Inside, old photographs of icebergs. The blue cracking open to sing. Another wonderful poem from The Mouth of Earth. And then uh, the last poem I think I'm going to read. Um, oh, did I just reverse the order? I think you on did, those? but that's okay. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I got back okay. at the very end. <laughs> uh, it's sun, Sunflowers. I used to have, I just want to say a little something about this poem. Um, I used to have a Dharma teacher who liked to say, when things get really bad, go outside. And even if you aren't in nature, just go outside and look up at the sky and it will help you just kind of feel better and help you take a deep breath. And if you can't go outside, just look at a picture of nature, um, which is what I do in this poem. Sunflowers. I'm looking at a photograph of two people I love standing in a group of sunflowers taller than their heads. Her face does not look like the face of someone whose shitty childhood could form the librettos for several grand operas, as his does not look like the face of a man who's just been diagnosed with cancer. No, they look like people who have spent a day on their knees in a garden, who know the patience all soil will teach you. Above them, the faces of the sunflowers look the way things look when they have been loved all their lives, their petals unfurled in a halo whose peeled sunlight is the color I would choose if someone said, find a shade for joy. Another beautiful one. It was Sunflowers from the Mouth of Earth, a book I really recommend everybody get. I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned in the last episode that I read this whole book in line at the post office on a very long uh, rural post office line, and it just made the time fly by. So thanks so much for that. Um, but just a, a wonderful book, and we got to see a great arc of it. Um, in the comments, everybody's asking about um, experimental poems. And um, so Paul Corbeil is asking whose experimental poetry has influenced you. So do you want to, any names you can name? Oh, gosh. Um, let's see. Well, I happen to have this book within reach. Um, I would say he's experimental. Um, Richard Scott Soho, his experimental poetry doesn't look like my poetry, but he'll do things like... Um, He'll, he'll write in the marginalia here, like people that he's thinking about or referencing in his work. Um, he has very, very um, violent enjambments in his work. Um, in other words, he breaks lines in places you would not expect a line ending to be, um, with the result that you can read a lot of his lines in different ways. Um, who else? Uh, this is kind of an older, um, older 20th century poet. But um, when I was a teenager, I read a lot of E.E. E. Cummings, um, who's a, a great clown um, and, and loves to play around with language. Um, and my poetry is nothing like his, but something about um, a kind of permission, I think, um, maybe went in there and, and stayed there. Um, as soon as this question goes by, I'm going to think of like five more people. I'm sort of looking over at my bookshelf um, because I, I always draw a blank when people ask me these questions. So if you're an experimental poet I love, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's one of the things that we don't publish a whole bunch of it, Rattle. Um, and um, I'd love it to publish more because people don't really send it much. There's a sort of... Um, way that uh, what you publish becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. But when we have strange mm -hmm. poems, it's always um, fun to, to do something different. And um, so so that's really neat that you're you're branching out in that way. Um, let me see. Um, and the other the other question about um, f um form, have you ever heard of cryptographic poems? This is Caitlin Buxbaum's asking about this. Cryptographic. I'm not even sure what that what that is. Like a cipher? Um, is that what that would be? 
I don't know. I don't know. I'm, it's interesting. I'm yeah, not I, sure. I... <laughs> Maybe Caitlin can put in the comments what it is. It's possible I've read one and I didn't know it was called that. Oh, Evie Shockley. Evie Shockley uh, um, mm-hmm. does a lot of experimental poetry, and I love her work and um, have read her book, The New Black, probably 10 or 12 times um, and taught some of her poems. And um, I highly recommend her work. It's She's also a formalist, um, so don't think experimental is like, oh, I won't know what to do with it. Um, lots of sonnets in there as well as poems that make X's on the page or, or um, play, play with form in unusual ways. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Caitlin says that it does. It is poems with ciphers. So somehow hmm. I'm imagining yeah. how it could be maybe with them. Um, I don't know. You have to decode it as you go and it changes the poem. That's it. I've never seen a poem like that, but that would wow. be really interesting. Um, um, the other thing that you, you do is you have two novels as well as poem, uh, books of poetry. Um, what is it like writing novels and, and, and jumping back and forth between the other? And, and as, a, as, a, as an author, what's your experience like? Is it different publishing a novel? Like, does it feel... Because when you publish a book of poems, I don't know, you know how, what percentage of the people <laughs> listening have done it, but it's sort of like this big like labor and then like silence and it's done, you know, like there's really not a whole lot. I mean, you do readings and, and, you know, do you do things like the rattle cast? Um, but, but I, in my fantasies, like a novelist gets a little more attention and has more readers. Is that, is that, I don't know. Is there a difference between the two in that way? And from the actual um, publishing angle? In terms of publishing, I mean, yes, novels generally do get more attention than books of poems. Um, the thing, it's such a different enterprise. Um, and I, I'm, I'm terrible at this sort of self-promotion, self-marketing thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm sort of e- equally bad at whether, whether it's poetry or, or fiction. Um, but I do sometimes get feedback on individual poems within a collection or, or the collection as well. And certainly... You know, my first novel was published in 2002. And if you, you know, if you wanted to write to the author, you had to send it in care of the publisher. And now you can just like shoot me an email on my website. And so there's, I think there's less of a difference than there used to be because we are so much more interconnected via the, via the web than we used to be. Uh, what are the novels about? Just to get people curious so they go buy them. <laughs> well, um, okay, hang on. Okay. The first one, Burning the Sea, is is out of print, although you could probably still get it um, at, a, at a used bookstore. Uh, it is about, um, it takes place in the Dominican Republic, and it's about a West Indian man and an American woman, um, both of them LGBT, who wind up in the Dominican Republic. And it the novel sort of follows them um, crashing around in a culture that is not their own Um to think about um, the way that Americans so often do uh, sort of leave a wide swath of colonial detritus in their, in their wake without really being aware of it. Um, and also what it means to, um, to be unaware of one's own history, either personally or, or on a cultural level. Um, and my second novel is The Fainting Room, um, which is in print and also just came out as an audio book this year. Oh, so did if you, you like audio books, you yourself? Um, did somebody, uh... I did not read it myself. No, um, somebody else read it and, and, and did a good job at it. And, um, and, and I'm glad I'm glad that she was the reader and not me. Um, uh, I can probably explain what it's about quicker by reading the back <laughs> of the few lines on the back. OK, The Fainting Room. Ray Shepard is a wealthy architect who has mystified his friends by marrying Evelyn, a woman who works at a nail salon. Evelyn hides a secret past about her former life in the circus, her ex-husband's mysterious death, and the colorful tattoos she carefully conceals under her clothes. When Evelyn starts to cave under the pressure of living in Ray's rarefied world, she suggests they take in Ingrid, a 16-year-old girl with safety pins in her ears, a thing for crime novels, and no place to stay for the summer. As Evelyn and Ray both make her their confidant, drawing her into the heart of what threatens their marriage, Ingrid increasingly adopts the noir alter ego of Detective Slade, Fedora and all, 
in order to solve the mysteries that have begun to engulf all three characters. Oh, wow. So and, and the feigning room. similar to the, like, the, the last question uh, about how this book came to be, um, it, obviously you can't come up with a novel story, you know, a novel plot by writing a whole bunch of poems and all of a sudden you have a novel. <laughs> so um, how, did, how does a novel come to be? Um, does it start as a short story? So, I'm just completely clueless about it. No, like, it didn't. Kind of I, I always knew I was going to write a novel. Um, this novel actually grew out of my obsession with Raymond Chandler novels, mm. um, as well as some autobiographical elements from my own past that kind of found their way in. Um, but I was interested in um, writers who write these kind of like really morally upstanding knight in shining armor kind of guys, which his... Um, his narrator, Philip Marlowe is, you know, he's this sort of tough talking, like, you know, you think of like Humphrey Bogart or Roger, Robert Mitchum in a film noir novel and you, you have the character. Um, but, you know, he always does the right thing and it's him against corrupt society. Um, but in his personal life, Raymond Chandler was a mess. He was an alcoholic. He cheated on his wife. Um, he, he was not able to live up to the persona that he created. And, I know a lot of people like that. Um, I mean, I think none of us live up to the I ideals that we create for ourselves. Um, some of us try harder than others. But I was interested in this book about trying to figure out what makes basically good people do really bad things. Um, also, I was interested in the role of what do I want to say here? Um, the way that we learn things about ourselves that sometimes we need to invent a story in order to get at the truth of, um, the, the teenager in this novel slowly over the course of the book, um, comes out and needs to kind of dress up in this very theatrical way as somebody, somebody out of a film, a film noir movie in order to, understand this thing about herself. Um, and I think that for anybody who grew up, you know, with their nose buried in a book throughout their childhood, <laughs> you're going to know what I'm talking about. Um, when I talk about the transformative power of fiction and the way that reading stories isn't just for entertainment or moral instruction as the only two poles, but also to discover things about ourselves that we didn't know were true. Um, and, and poetry does that too. So that's that's for me really the biggest crossover right there. Yeah, it brings it all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning with um, you know surprise and self discovery and, and the subconscious knowing more than uh, than than you know you know. Um, uh, here's a, here's a lightning round kind of question: um, Is there a poem <laughs> that um, you've read by somebody else that you're so jealous that you wish you wrote? <laughs> oh God, yeah, there's so many. Is there one that stands yeah. out that says, "Oh God, why didn't I write that"? Couldn't have been me. <laughs> oh man, um, and can, and can I lay my hands on it? Um, oh yeah, there's so many. Um, I can't. I can't answer that question. <laughs> Well, well, several I mean, like people. Ten, palm, ten palms, you know, come to mind, and I can't think of the titles, and I don't think I've got like any of the books on hand. So you have people have mentioned um, that I should do more like actor studio type questions. So that was my that was attempt number three for doing an actor studio type question. <laughs> yeah, um, if people are interested in queer authors, so I cannot recommend this book highly enough. I really really like it, um, and there are definitely some poems in here that I wish I wish I had written. That's Richard Scott's book, Soho. Richard Scott's Soho, British writer. Yeah. Um, well, there's one last poem that you want to read. It's about coming up on the hour. Um, you want to read my tie to finish up. Yeah. And I wanted to end with this poem because it is in the December issue of Rattle. So I, I thought that would be a nice poem to go out on. Um, and also the segue of um, talking about uh, the character in this novel, kind of needing to discover things um, uh, about herself through, um, through dressing up. Uh, this poem kind of gets at that energy as well. <clears throat> okay. My tie. I smooth it down my shirt front between my breasts. That little hiss, a cat call almost. But when I make for myself, 
the drag and give of silk, the thrill of the display, like what a man I dated told me once. The reason for lipstick, he said, is to make a proxy cunt of the mouth, since humans are the only animals to hide their genitals with clothes. He was putting on lipstick as he said this, becoming a woman as I watched from my perch on his bed. Now I walk down the street in my tie and things happen not only to the swing of my shoulders, the lope of my hips. Women comment, the men look away. I don't know that ex-lover anymore. Can't ask him what I long to ask him. If he ever wanted, when he was through using it, to unknot the silk of his cock and let someone else slip it on. This thing that was part of him, but not in the way we'd thought, as the red of his mouth became the red of my mouth when we kissed hard enough. Wonderful. That was my tie from the newest issue of Rattle, Rattle number 70. Sarah P. Strong, thanks so much for being a guest today. Just wonderful poems. And now I want to read your novel even more than I did before. I was thinking I want to read it, and now I definitely want to read it. So thanks so much for, for sharing some of that. And just this, this wonderful book, once again, The Mouth of Earth. I'll put it on the screen so everybody can see um, it's The Mouth of Earth by Sarah P. Strong. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much. I hope you have a good rest of your day. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. I've really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, me too. Have a good night. All right. Bye. Bye. Yeah, and that was per Sarah P. Strong with her book, The Mouth of Earth. Um, and Sarah's first book, let me remind everybody once again uh, what it was. It was... Um, um, Tour of the Breath Gallery, which was winner of the Walt McDonald First Book Prize from Texas Tech in 2013. Find more of Sarah's work at sarahpstrong.com. That's Sarah with an H, S-A-R-A-H, pstrong.com for more of Sarah's work. Now, once again, we're going to move on to the open mic. And um, we're going to take a little bit of a break, uh, again, like we did last time, um, just so I can get things situated. Um, but before I do, let me tell you how to, how to participate. So um, first thing you can do is send a poem to openmic at rattle.com. Now, whatever you'd like to share, we have a prompt for this week. And the prompt for this week was... The prompt for this week was... Um, a still life is a work of art depicting mostly inanimate objects and mostly inanimate and typically commonplace objects. Write a still life poem. That was your prompt for this week. But we are now um, letting it be open to anything you want to share. So um, so the prompt is kind of a guide, but anything you want to share. If you published a poem recently and would like to share that, if um, friends or students of Sarah want to call in and share a poem that you've written in one of her classes, anything goes. It's really a, we have about 45 minutes maybe, and we'll um, see what we can do. Um, but before we do, let me just tell you next week's guest is going to be um, Amy Miller and uh, Amy Miller's newest book is The Trouble with New England Girls Amy Miller's very similar to um, Sarah P. Strong in that uh, we published Amy a lot over the years one of the most frequently published po poets in Rattle um, most recently she was in Rattle number 67 but um, she's been in Poets Respond a whole bunch of times and um, after the break I'll read a sample poem of hers then we'll get into the open mic so uh, I'll see you in just few minutes actually not a few minutes maybe like 30 seconds i get some stuff set up okay bye All right, well, we're back. And um, yeah, so next week's guest is going to be Amy Miller. And 
Here is a poem, sort of, um, I thought this one goes along a little bit with uh, today's topic. And um, hopefully I can set it up so you all can hear. This is Amy Miller reading To the Firefighters Sleeping in the Yard. It's one of my favorite poems um, we've ever published from Poets for Spond. This came um, in, was it August 7th, 2018? So a little over two years ago in response to um, some of the big forest fires we had then. Um, and here, here uh, is Amy Miller reading To the Firefighters Sleeping in the Yard, next week's uh, guest poet. To the firefighters sleeping in the yard. Statistically, your mothers know, those hot shot tragedies hardly ever happen. They worry more for your lungs, your feet, 26 bones of curled arboreal they once could hold. They worry what you're eating, warm burritos wrapped in foil, handed to you by a shy two-year-old girl. And of course, they dream of horses running, a cat taking refuge under a car that flashes metal and glass, dream of the houses they raised you in, the thin roofs peeling up, how the smoke whistles and crackles with its particles that were everything, everyone it took, how it snows its flecks of everything, everyone, down like night, like sleep. Statistically, one grown child looks much like another, sooty, spent, a war-stained face turned away. This infuriates mothers, not knowing if you're theirs, while they scratch at the screen, trying to blow up some twice-removed photo taken by a man whose house you saved with your axes that slumber beside you and a single hose stretched to the limit now slack. But any mother, anyone, can recognize this, the way you curl against the ground while catastrophe shrieks on, how you, all of us, have to lay down your weapons just for an hour and sink into that dark old well of refuge, one hand between your knees. And that was Amy Miller reading to the firefighters sleeping in the yard. And uh, it's based on this photo, I should tell everybody. Let me see if it's still here. Yeah, this was a viral photo back then of the firefighters sleeping in the yard. So this was an ekphrastic poem. For those just listening uh, after the fact, this is, um, you know, a burned out area in California or maybe Oregon. And it looks like five firefighters sleeping in the yard there. And uh, that was a poem by Amy Miller. So let's open up the open lines. And um, we have, let's see, Nivedita, Brent, Caitlin Buxbaum, Kathy Gibbons, Joy Stahl, and Gail Hemmen are all lined up. If you'd like to participate, once again, uh, just email your poem to openmic at rattle.com, all one word, whatever you want to share. If it was something you published recently, you can include a link, if, especially if it's online, and that'll be nice. We can uh, share and shout out to that uh, literary magazine that you published it in. Um, if you want to share a prompt poem, please do, and uh, we'll see what we get. And uh, once you send it to me at rattle, open mic at rattle.com, then uh, send me a chat message over Skype, Rattle Poetry, all one word. Just say hello, and I'll call you back when we have time. And uh, if you want to call over phone, it's 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. And I will call you back when the time is right, but we won't go past uh, about, uh, you know, 11 p.m. Eastern time, so it won't be too late if you uh, call, I'll call you back. Um, now, once again, the prompt poem for the prompt for this week was A still life is a work of art depicting mostly inanimate and typically commonplace objects. Write a still life poem. And um, this is my still life poem. It's based on a, um, an actual bench on a trail that we hike by one of the, there's probably, you know, a dozen good trails right around in the mountains where we live. And uh, one of them goes by, there's this little side trail and there's this bench and um, it's hard not to think a lot about it every time you pass. And um, so I'll try to capture that here. This is Christina's bench. Christina's bench. Every autumn evening, the honey light lifts its 
itself reluctantly from the seat of the bench. The pine planks of the backrest making a blade of shadow, this accidental sundial sweeping away the day, remaining slant of light like a golden sheet pulled taut by gentle hands that aren't there but must be, hidden in the rabbit brush or in a stand of ponderosa down the ridge, loving hands cradling invisible wires, a magician's assistant well hidden off stage, any kind of magic to explain the otherwise stillness, the weight of the air as time is measured in wood grain, line by darker line letting go, sapwood over heartwood over sapwood, until only the bronze plaque on the arm is illuminated, first star of the night, a single name, two dates too close together, the patina on the armrest too smooth. That is Christina's Bench, um, my poem for this week. Now, um, Megan's poem was Still Life with Salt Shaker. Lying on her side, she's an old-time movie star in a silk-white gown draped across a black piano. And when she opens her silver mouths to sing, her soprano is so rich the audience can taste it. Oh, that's a good one. I like that a lot. I love short poems. Still Life with Salt Shaker by Megan. And of course, these are Megan's prompts that she comes up with every week for us. Now, uh, let's see what you have this week. I think we'll call up uh, Nivedita first because she is waiting. Let's see. Yeah, we, she's about to start her work day over in India. So let's get to her first so she can get to work. Hello. Hey, Nivedita, how are you doing today? Hey, let me pull you in. You weren't in the... Okay. Um, yeah, I'm doing great. Oops, I messed that up. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, so what do you have for us? Do you, do you wrote a prompt poem, I assume? Mm-hmm. A prompt poem, indeed. Um, and and uh, has anything you want to say about it? Um, not much. It's the eponymous to life painting, bowl of fruits, basically. Okay, and great. I just sort of correlated that with the sort of people you meet and their attitudes. Excellent. Well, go ahead and read it whenever you're, you're ready. I'll put it on screen for everybody. Great. Thank you. Attitudes. Lost in thought, she sits at the dining table, wondering about the attitudes of people around her. Some are shiny and nice on the outside, yet tender on the inside. They are the ones to watch out for, just like these apples in the fruit bowl here. Drop them once, and they lie, bruised to the core. Some are prickly on the outside and sweet on the inside. It takes much effort to get to know them, just like this pineapple here. The effort of getting to the goodness on the inside is well worth the effort. Some are slippery as can be, yet show a sunny disposition. It takes a good eye to spot the rottenness within, just like this banana here. Hunger prompted her to peel the yellow skin off, revealing a spoiled, squishy, rotten mush inside. Lost in thought, she sits at the dining table, wondering about the attitudes of people around her. Thanks so much for the attitudes by Nivedita Karthik. Thanks for sharing that, Nivedita. Thank Always you so a pleasure. Much. Uh, have a great rest Always of your day. Always lovely to talk to you. Thank yep. you. Have a nice evening. Yep. Bye. Bye bye. Okay. Um, I have to figure out why uh, it's still the same thing. Okay. Um, let's go to. Oh, and Vicky Miko and Richard Westheimer are chiming in as well. But I'll just go in order since um, I'll do. What I'll always do is, um, you know, new callers, first time callers, I'll try to get to them first just to make sure we can. And then I'll swing back in order they were received from people we've heard from before. And next up is Brent, Brent Stauffer. Let's see what Brent had for us today. Yep, another still life poem. Let's see what Brent's still life was. Hey, Brent, how you doing tonight? I am doing fantastic. How are you? I'm doing great. It's a good night. Great night of poetry. Um, what do you got for yeah, us? Yeah, yeah. It was really good. Um, well, I have a still life type poem. Um, I had uh, some uh, grand designs for it uh, because it's, it's based on a poem that I wrote 20 years ago that I have since lost to the, uh, from moving so many times. Oh, I hate that. So, I have one poem where I feel like I discovered the meaning of the universe and yeah. it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's 
probably was in there somewhere. Yeah, it had to do with like it, it was science. It's sciencey. It had to do with points and probabilities, and I've tried to find it so many times. Um, oh, oh gosh. Oh. And I really, it was one of those, like, you know, like a little bit too much of the, uh, you know, in late at night, but it, it made sense. Yeah. <laughs> did, did you ever try rewriting it? I don't think I could. I don't know what it, I, I don't have enough of it. It was weird. It was a weird kind of channeled thing and I can't find it. Wow. But anyway. Wow. That sounds really good. Yeah. This, <laughs> I've, this is the third or fourth poem that I have, uh, rewritten many years later without having, uh, access to to the original and originally that was gonna it was gonna be called still life of a poem of a memory in a poem or something like that and um um i just ended up cutting all the bits that were about how it was a memory and all this stuff and just and just uh so it, we're, we're left with how, how it is interesting cool well i'm glad we could, could bring you back into this poem here yeah Okay, it's uh, still life. Um, I found a face on the gritty ground, sloping up from the running track to the deserted swimming pool. It's true I had been looking for something. His boxer's battered nose was the pale body of a condom, his right eye smartly monocled by the perfect ring of its base. His left eye, a dumb black rock, squinted upward in defiance a tuft of dry brown grass his broomy mustache a twig spindly and thin mouthed an unrepentant scowl it wasn't the sign i'd been looking for the evening light lingered briefly over the whole of crestwood park shadows planned their slow revolt i hurried home and wrote a poem Excellent, man. That that condom metaphor is going to stick with me for a long time. <laughs> well, based on a true story. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm never going to see a guy with a black eye. <laughs> the same guy. <laughs> thanks, Brett. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. See have you a good time. night. Bye. Bye. Yeah. So I kind of had a revelation uh, last week. I realized that this right here is all I ever wanted out of poetry myself personally was just a reason to write a poem once a week and then like some reason to share it somewhere. So like an open mic or a poetry workshop or something that meets once a week with uh, where you can write a poem once a week and, um, and share it is uh, really, that's that, that was, that's what made me uh, end up here just cause that's all I really want to do. So I'm really glad uh, to all you out there who are sharing your poems and participating in this. It's just a lot of fun for me. Maybe it's uh, selfish for me to think of it that way, but, but I do. It's a lot of fun. Um, next up, let's call uh, Kathy Gibbons. I know I saw Kathy's poem on here. Yeah, there we go. Still life steps in breath. Pandemic traveling. Hey, Kathy, how are you doing tonight? Hi, Tim. I'm doing great. Thank you. Really enjoying the evening, and Sarah's presentation was wonderful. Yeah, it really was. She, Sarah's one of my favorite poets, for sure. Um, so so what do you have first? You have a still life, and you mentioned, um, what was what the phrase you used in this email? You said, um, I enjoy pandemic traveling to other places, which is such an interesting uh, way to put it. But yeah, you know what? I've been uh, using Google Earth in, in uh, Google Maps a lot more, just, I don't know, I didn't even realize I was doing it, but I, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, actually, I think the, it's been self-quarantine for me since March, and, and the two things I think I miss the most are, the first one is hugs, because mm-hmm. I'm a big hugger. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's hard. And the, the other one is travel. And uh, so I've been satisfying my longing for travel by watching a lot. Actually, a, a great way is to watch a lot of television and movies that go to places where I haven't been or uh-huh. maybe I have been before But um, and visiting that way. And also by looking at photographs, both my own from previous travels and other people's too. And so this poem... Uh, thank you, Megan, for the wonderful prompt because it really made me happy to look back through things, uh, different photographs I'd taken. And this uh, poem is um, inspired by uh, a trip to New York City a couple years ago and two pigeons I met on the steps of the Metropolitan Museum. So anyway, that's where that came from. <laughs> Excellent. And, well, go ahead. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. It's called 
still life, steps, and breath. How a homeless man warns me on the steps of the subway. It's a long way up. Escalator over there. He is right, of course, though I ignore, going breathless after five, six sets of seven steps apiece. The last holds nine, and I take my time when they finally take my breath away. And as stale summer air assails my puffing nostrils, I ascend. How some pigeons pose for me on collected steps up at the Met, cascading steps in front closed to humans on this day of Puerto Rican Pride Parade. The pigeons, too, dappled white and stolid, solid black, sit simply silent on their separate steps, regarding me left out about as though I am an object in their very own exhibit, a still life diorama. How shortly after noon, this sunny Saturday, Bleecker and McDougal, Cafe Wa, Purple Jimmy stares in silence as the thronging crowds go by. Pick up b-ball, corner playground, drawing fans, no box seats, only standing, hands clutching, chain link fence as hot dogs stretch their steps, roam and dribble lazy layups down their lanes. How behind this court, a tucked in handball space, older man, breasts come fast and hard, red faced, panting, jubilant to face his opponent 40 years at least his junior. Though winded, he wins this match quite handily. There's still life left there, too. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kathy. It was Kathy Gibbons with uh, her prompt poem, Still Life, Steps, and Breath. And, and I was definitely transported there. Thanks thanks so much for taking me there, Kathy. Uh, thanks, Tim. Okay, you have a good night. You too. Good night. Bye-bye. Okay. And one thing I forgot to mention, um, in addition to the fact that um, – um, you don't have to do the prompt poem. You can share something else if you'd like. Um, you also, um, if you if you don't want to share, if you don't want to read the poem and, and appear live on air, you can email it to me, and I can uh, read it for you. So that's another option too, for anybody who, um, um, for anybody who, you know, can't call in or can't stay that late. We can still share your poems. We have. I'd like to give it. It's nice stretching out and, and relaxing and. Um, Spending some time with these and, and not feeling rushed. So that's why we uh, extended the show a little bit. Um, let us see. Who's next? So Patricia Rockwood um, sent in Still Life Poem. Um, and she's a new uh, first-time person. So, um, um, yeah, so I'll read it for her if she doesn't call in later. Uh, Patricia Rockwood sent interlude uh, for the prompt. But let's, uh, I'll stick with the people who uh, do want to call in live in case she wants to call in live later. Um, and let's go to uh, Joy Stahl. Find Joy's poem here. So the phone's ringing for Joy. Hey, Joy, how are you doing tonight? All right. Uh, let me get your poem into a document so I don't... Tell everyone your email address. Okay, so your poem is still life. Um, is there anything you want to yeah. say about it before you start? Well, two, uh, two or three things actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I wrote it immediately after you gave the prompt. It was one of those right away inspired things. Oh, that's great! I love and those kind of poems. Then I always intended to add a stanza and didn't get to that until right after, like right when the show was starting. Uh, at the end of my evening class that nobody showed up to, but oh, yeah. I still stayed and worked. <laughs> uh, and then while during the Rattlecast, uh, they called a late start for tomorrow for school. So I'm now happy that I brought my grading home. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what, uh, you teach uh, grade school? Middle school. Middle yeah. school? Yeah. How, so, how's it seven, going? Like Kids just are not, sh- are not showing up for class? Well, we're in person again. Um, oh, really? We have been since after Thanksgiving break, so three basically three weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they, they're done. They don't want to be in school this week at all, and uh, they yeah. are finishing assignments. They know grades are due on Friday, and they are squirrely as all get out. <laughs> where, where are you going? Are you in North Carolina? Or am I well, thinking Kansas. Kansas, okay. 
Um, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, let's hear this. This is Still Life. All right. Still Life. The apples, oranges, and grapes are artfully arranged and draped over a pottery bowl, which, I must say, has seen better days. That gives it character, of course. Cracks and shadows, no remorse at imperfection. I shake myself from an introspection. It is no wonder I can't reproduce with pigment and brush. No use to stare at colors and shapes as I fruitlessly dab paint onto canvas. I've been painting this for so long, shadows have crept along, and my attempts to adjust them has only muddied the colors. Bob Ross would tell me to believe in myself. That isn't my summit to achieve. What I do not believe in is the reality of this still life still before me. Excellent poem. Thanks so much. I love the rhymes, too. Um, thanks so much. That was Joy Stahl with thanks. Still Life. Thanks, Joy. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Um, let's see. So, Kath, uh, Vicky Miko sent a hi, but I'll read that later, too. Uh, let's call up before, let's see. Well, let's call up. <laughs> Caitlin says, uh, call me up if you can squeeze me in before 6.30, which I think might be um, right now. Hey, Caitlin, okay. is it is it 6.30 there? <laughs> it is 6.28. Yeah, okay. But, uh, I, I wasn't sure which uh, which Alaskan time zone you were in, so I wasn't sure if it would be 6.30 or 5.30. Um, but do you... Oh, there's only like, five like people. <laughs> two tiny islands okay. yeah, that, are, yeah, that are in that time zone. Um, so okay, so you gotta, you gotta go somewhere, um, but, I assume. So you could be quick. What a. Yeah. Um, so I've had a tendency lately to be more ambitious, like disproportionately to my inspiration. <laughs> so I'm like, I have this great idea, and like, I haven't had writer's block in months. And this week it's just been like painful to write poems. So I know this one needs more work, but I like let the concept. Let me ask you, so how many poems share. do you write a week on average? What do you say? Well, so I can't give you a good answer because from winter solstice last year to summer solstice this year, I was writing a poem mm -hmm. basically every day. And then um, I slowed down a little bit in the summer, and then I did the two below 30 and 30 in August. Basically, since October, I write like maybe okay. one well, a that's, week. That's more. <laughs> but before that, I was yeah, writing every yeah, day. Yeah, gotcha, so, gotcha. It's you know. hard to sustain that every day thing. <laughs> Especially when you, like, let it go. I think that was the biggest mistake was, like, slacking off. I was like, oh, well, I met my goal, so now I can <laughs> yeah, just, Yeah, like, everyone I know who uh, write writes it. a poem every single day hasn't stopped, which is why they still write a poem every single day, I guess. Um, okay, so yep. this is Still Life of Emily Dickinson's Children. Yes, I just found out about a book. Well, it's called Her Herbarium. And the Harvard Library has scans of um, this book from when she was nine to 16. She collected flowers and like was a little botanist when she was a preteen um, and apparently referred to flowers as her children in letters to people. So hence uh, the title okay, cool, of this poem. Cool. All right. Still Life of Emily Dickinson's Children. Jasmine and violet, pressed into pages too starkly delicate for today's fingers. Who could have known these gray greens and yellows, these pale purpled petals, would, though bruised, outlast their earthly lives, secured in the gentle script of a mother kept by beauty and death? Yet to see the veined palm-like leaves reaching for their maker, one must wonder. What daisy, rose, or aster was denied there ever after, seeds forever frozen for scholars to peruse? What right had she who wrote, I'm nobody, who are you, to kill her darlings just to stop them growing Excellent. old? I love the ending. Thanks so much. That was definitely an ambitious poem. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks. Yeah, I'll let you know if I ever feel yeah. satisfied with it. <laughs> great. Well, have a great uh, rest of your night and wherever you got to go. Have a good one. Bye. Yep. Thanks. You too. Bye. Okay. Let's see. 
Next up, we will do... Um, let's call up Richard Westheimer. He has a poem that is not from the prompt. So he's the first... I think this is the first person to actually not do a prompt poem in a while. We'll see what Richard has today. Um, and here it is. Hey, Tim. Hey, Richard. How are you doing tonight? I am doing great. Um, I do not have a prompt poem for the week, so I'm sorry. I really loved your description earlier of why you've turned to this, because um, I just love reading and listening to poems in groups, uh, almost almost better than sitting down with a book. Yeah, me too. I mean, this is really the, the highlight of my, at least work week, you know, I mean, it's really, I just love doing this. And, uh, and it sort of reattaches me to what I liked about poetry in the first place or something, which is just this sort of, yeah, it's a communal act like those, I used to have a um, writing group that just met every Tuesday night in a, in a Borders bookstore back when, before mm -hmm. they went out of business. Yeah. And uh, we'd have to get our coffees and we'd all share a poem. And then we'd share, I think we did a, a poem that we liked of somebody else. And then we shared a poem that we wrote for critique, you know, and it was just, that was like the pinnacle of, of um, literature for me. That was just what I liked about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm in a group now that um, we're working through this book. Have you ever seen, do you know this one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's the, uh, and, for the people, it's a book of luminous things. Uh, yeah. And, and it's, uh, I'm reading the section now that's really about still lives, hmm. which is, was great for the week. Uh, but, None, none of them worked for me. So I dug a little bit into the past and, and took great. you up on your invitation. Yeah. So, so what do you have? Um, so I have a poem, uh, and this this is was sort of an experiment. It was sort of trying to weave interviews and words of Maxine Kuhlman mm. with a few of my own thoughts into a poem. It's mostly her words sort of taken out of context, as it were. Interesting. Um, and I sort of admired her journey from... Uh, into somebody felt who felt compelled to write politically after years of thinking that was not what she was about. Yeah. Um, and and just for explanation, the first word Bereshit is actually in Hebrew. It's it's the first word in the Bible in the beginning. Ah, okay. So just to give it some context. So the epigraph. Uh, do you have it up there? I or do. Is, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the epigraph. Um, ben. Bag Bag used to say, turn it and turn it again, for everything is in it. Pour over it and wax gray and old over it. And the title is Bereshit of Horses, Torture, Soil, and a Wandering Jew, after the works and words of Maxine Kuhlman. Interesting. My garden beds raised like fresh graves among mown rows must be tended every day, like writing without the guilt, like a Calvinist would, with grace, like a Jew by good works, like me, divining lines as I make order from anarchy, from the soil, from mud, make words grow work, couple rhymes in troubled time. Writers, the writer said, we are all secret Jews, we turn it all and turn it again, for everything is in it. We are gardeners, sifting silt, growing verses from dirt, and I am an atheist in the land of Jesus, a witness who, when told to repent and assured we are all brothers in Christ, just sings along, sighs at the tight tunes, the high, so lonesome so, so lonesome sound. Then one day I said, I was a Jew. I wish I had, I wanted to, but I was wrong, born wrong for hymnal games, a stranger in a stranger land, one who grows loam and eats words and spits them as witness to the moldering chaos. The slaughter wrought when worms and rainfall and rot rise singing Amazing grace, how sweet the smell of decay. And like the ravening nematodes churning my earth, I kill to keep whatever pleases me. Last summer, to save the raspberries, I immolated hundreds of coppery Japanese beetles. To save the sweet corn, I caged and shot gravid raccoons. And I'd do it again, 
even as I write witness about atomic war and Dick Cheney shooting caged pheasants and causing caged men to be sodomized in my name. And all I can do is turn all of this over like Ben Bag Bag, turn the shit squeezed from my horse's ass into soil, turn the soil into dinner, turn the torture my people reek, turn the spoiled fruits of enslaved labor, turn the great sordid emptiness, the void, bear a sheet into the beginning, into the word. Excellent poem, Richard. Uh, musical and, and imagistic as always. Was that published somewhere? Uh, no. Oh, no? No. I, no. Should be, I guess. I, I, this is the first time I've read it aloud in a group. So yeah, it's a good it. one. It works. works. Thanks for I sharing like it. it. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Okay, that was Richard Westheimer with Birth Sheet of Horses, Torture Soil, and a Wandering Jew. Um, let's see. Next up. Let's do... Um, uh, let's do... Let me read Vicky Miko's poem. Um... This is um, another, Vicky Miko likes to write hyben, which is always fun. And that's, of course, some um, prose with haiku sort of undercutting it or sort of changing it in a way. And um, here we go. This is uh, Vicky Miko, my present to myself, eighth grade art class of 63. My present to myself, 8th grade art class of 63. Paint a still life using items from the art bins, Miss Anderson said. You have only today and tomorrow to step up, sketch and outline your shadows. Lost in thought, we all scattered to empty and cherry pick from the six bins crammed with layers of unlike treasures. From frayed hats to toy trains to cracked bowls, hinges, bun foots, and various broken ogies. All the junk... In all the junk drawers, a multiverse. I want you to notice the angles from sun rays, she said. They'll change over the next couple hours. Leftover sun, the providence, and a piece of driftwood. All, we all scattered to grab our prize platforms. A credenza top, a stepladder along the baseboards, on counters next to the shiny sink. Backdrops were arranged, colored paper, corkboard, drapes with, between chairs miscellaneous tomes and stacks of things we found a dented tin creamer and its matching sugar bowl a shoebox and a ball of twine i staged my trophies on the desk in front of me last moon the magnetic moment of a spoon and fork with my prize nestled under crumpled paper newspaper i closed the box wrapped it with a funnies taped it with masking tape and tied it with a ragged twine it was my present to myself. Then I began to unwrap it, with all the wrappings left as is. I stood back to frame my brainchild, my pet, my concoction. Deadline, no shadow on the sundial. The animist poses a stone under the bar gel. Under the bell jar. Epilogue, my still life study, one first honorable mention, and a piece on the corridor wall, ready for the annual Robbinsdale Art Fair, Mr. Lee, the science teacher, bought my painting for twelve dollars. That was Vicky Miko with a wonderful a hyben. And once again, that was called um, "My Present to Myself," eighth grade art class of '63. Uh, thanks so much for sharing that, Vicky. It's always a pleasure. I'm a little self-conscious now reading poems, given how well uh, Sarah P. Strong read hers. I wish I was um, as good at uh, performing as she is, but I'm I'm not, unfortunately. Um, but it's still great to share with me these poems. So thanks so much for putting up with me. Let's call up a uh, Gail Hemmen because there is time. <clears throat> and Gail has another. Uh, this is a um, uh, hi, not Haiga. Haiga is the word. Hello. Good evening. Hey, Gail. How are you doing tonight? 
Oh, I'm doing pretty well. Thanks, Tim. I've really enjoyed hearing uh, hearing from Sarah and hearing everybody's poems tonight. It just feels like a fantastically uh, celebratory way to move into the holidays here, especially it, this year. It, it definitely does. And you have a, a holiday haiga for us here. I do. Um, I've, I've enjoyed um, haiku, learned about it here. In, well, I, I'd heard of it, but really got uh, excited here in, in Rattle. And then also a, a friend of mine writes haiga. So I'm um, just having a lot of fun. There's an app called Fonto, if anybody's interested in those uh, quiet COVID moments um, where you can put text on a photo. So it was suggested online, and I've had entirely too much fun with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'll put it on screen for everybody now. Um, and there it is. This is uh, the... What was the app again that you used so people can find it? Um, it's called Fonto. Mm-hmm. Fonto, okay. It's P H O N T O. So the way they spell. It. Great. Well, go ahead. So, so this for for people who are just listening on the podcast later, this is Christmas lights and some plastic uh, garland, and with, with some stuff yeah. in the background too. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, it's a uh, the garland is um it's it's so. Uh, old so the kind of old soft plastic and a and actually got it at a goodwill outlet which is fun that'll be cool and they would open that up again yeah. <laughs> um and um let's see green plastic garland holding stories in its boughs snowy needles cold oh excellent why don't you read it again since it's a haiku green plastic garland holding stories in its boughs snowy needles cold oh that's great i love the holding stories in its boughs what a great line Thanks so much for sharing that, Gail. Oh, thank you, Tim. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you, and stay safe. Happy holidays to, to you. Yeah, you too. Always oh. my pleasure. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, um, and then we have another. Uh, we have a lot of um, short work, which is nice. Uh, let me see. Let me make sure I'm not missing anybody too. This open mic. Okay, that was f- okay. Uh, let me. Let's read a uh, Patricia Rockwood's poem. This is interlude which you just sent. This is a still life poem. And uh, this is the first time sharing a poem of Patricia's here. Let me uh, put it on screen. I'll put it in a, a document really quick. Okay. Here we go. This is a interlude for the prompt by Patricia Lockwood. Rockwood. Here we go. Interlude. You set out the good china for tea by the window. Dusk motes making solar storms as you wait. Oh, another one. I love that. Interlude. A very haiku-like. I'll read it again since it's so short. You set out the good china for tea by the window. Dust motes making solar systems as you wait. I think I said storms the first time. Sorry about that. Um, dust motes making solar systems as you wait. That's beautiful, beautiful. Little short poem, Patricia. Thanks so much for sharing that. That was Patricia Rockwood, and um, she included um, just in her uh, email footer, she included her uh, website, which is Patricia, like you'd think, Rockwood with an R dot com, Patricia Rockwood dot com. So, so check out some of Patricia's work there. Uh, let me see. Is anybody else waiting to? Um, let's see. One last check to make sure we didn't miss anybody. And then we will let you know what the prompt is for next week. I think we did get everybody, though. Checking the call logs, checking the the email. Okay, I think we are good to go. So thanks once again, everybody, for for participating in this open mic. It's just I love uh, I love doing this every every Tuesday night. It's really a, a highlight for me, and, and every week is a lot of fun. Um, and thanks so much to Sarah P. Strong once again. We we looked at uh, Sarah's new book. Um, oops, let me get the rid of this thing. Sarah's new book, uh, The Mouth of Earth which is just out recently from test, this test site poetry series. And uh, you can find Sarah at sarahpstrong.com. That's Sarah with an H. Now, um, next week's prompt is going to be, uh, if I can find it again, uh, next week's prompt is, oh, yeah, I have to uh, open up a website here as well. So next week's prompt is... Um, the drum roll. We need the drum roll. Uh, write a clogernatch. Uh, clogernatch is a six-line Welsh form, and you can learn more about it at this link, writersdigest.com. Um, just type in clogernatch, um, and uh, you can find it that way. It's write-better-poetry, clogernatch, poetic-form, 
And uh, it's this website here. And let me describe it. Um, this is the form. Um, and this is uh, from Writer's Digest. Our friend Robert Lee Brewer does these. This is back in uh, his blog post for the, the form of the month or week for uh, October 20th, 2016 on the Writer's Digest. And uh, Clogger Natch, um, he, he writes, besides being another fun form to say, <laughs> like Rhymus Desolutus, Clogger Natch is also a fun poem to write. A Welsh poetic form is typically a six-line syllabic stanza with an A-B rhyme scheme. So um, there's six lines eight syllables in the first two, five syllables in the second two, and then three in the last two, and the rhymes are A-A-B-B-B-A. If you can follow that, if you can't follow that, just go to writersdigest.com and look it up. That's Cloggernatch, which is C-L-O-G-Y-R-N-A-C-H. So we'll have a lot of short poems next week uh, when everybody writes their Cloggernatches. Um, hope, uh, hope to see you then. Hope that you... Uh, you can enjoy writing it. And uh, next week's guest, once again, is going to be Amy Miller. And um, Amy is a poet we've published very frequently on Rattle.com. Um, published her in, I think, six or seven issues, just like uh, Sarah P. Strong. Um, but her newest book is The Trouble with New England Girls. And that'll be Rattlecast number 72, Tuesday. December 22nd, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, Rattlecast number 72 with Amy Miller. Hope to see you then, and have a good rest of your week in the meantime. Good night.